This morning we began trying to look at the subject of suffering. The Word of God says that it is better if the will of God be so that we suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. All suffering, I believe, falls into one of three categories. Either suffering for well-doing, suffering for evil-doing, or suffering as a trial of our faith. Peter writes more about suffering than anyone else in the Bible. <clears throat> While we were singing, I, that question came to my mind. Why was Peter so involved in teaching us so much about suffering? Why is so much of Peter's writing about suffering? Of course, I think that one of the reasons is because he had suffered... I want to reread, I want to re-mention some of the statements Peter makes about suffering and then I think I have an answer that came to me while we were singing about why Peter writes so much about suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19, the word of God says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. So it's important that we endure grief and that we are willing to suffer wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So it's important that we are willing to suffer and that we take it patiently. That we endure those sufferings and that we withstand against all the various kinds of sufferings we have to experience. He says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, he says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. If we're suffering for righteousness sake, he says, happy are ye. Then he says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, he says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, and being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Christ suffered, and we ought to be willing to suffer also. Jesus makes this statement. He says, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Now, if I don't feel greater than Christ, and I know how much Christ suffered, how willingly he suffered, I ought to be willing to suffer also. And he says in chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange Concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. It says in verse 16, 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, he says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God on this behalf. And he says in verse 19, 1 Peter 4, 19, he says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So when you're suffering, you don't need to try to get even with those who are bringing the suffering, but you need to commit your soul unto God Remember that God says that we're to say, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Leave it in the hands of God. And don't ever try to retaliate for those that bring suffering in your life. He says in 1 Peter 5, 10, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, he says, But the God of all grace, who hath 
called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Now, all these scriptures, and there are others that I didn't touch on, but in all these scriptures that Peter writes about, he keeps talking about us suffering and the importance of us understanding that we need to know that we're going to suffer. We need to know that we ought to be enduring suffering. And we ought not to be thinking it strange when those sufferings come. And here's what the Lord gave to me or reminded me of while we were singing. And I believe this is the reason that Peter writes so much about suffering. Have you ever done something wrong and somebody said something harshly to you when you did something that was wrong? I'm talking about you did something wrong and somebody said something so harshly that you never forget it as long as you live. It just, it's there. It's made such a strong impression on you that you, you did something and you were rebuked sharply. I want you to look in your Bibles just a moment. I believe this is the reason that Peter writes so much about suffering. Look at first Peter, I'm sorry, look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. We find that in this particular point in Peter's life, Peter did not know that Christ was going to suffer and he didn't know how much he was going to have to suffer. So in, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, listen to verses 21, beginning in verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You hear Peter rebuking Jesus? I don't know of any, anybody else in all the scriptures ever rebuked Jesus. Certainly not any other apostle ever rebuked Jesus. Here's what Jesus said to him. Verse 23 says, But he turned, that is Jesus turned, and said unto Peter. Now I want you to remember that. He didn't turn and talk to the devil. He turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Well, I'll tell you what, if you ever call me Satan, I think I would remember what it was that I did that would call you, cause you to call me Satan. Do you understand? And the reason that Jesus spoke so harshly is that Peter did not understand that Jesus was going to have to suffer. He didn't understand how much Jesus was going to have to suffer. And he didn't understand that all Christians are going to have to suffer. And so Jesus makes such a, an emphatic statement to Peter right here that he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Men don't want to suffer. Peter didn't want Jesus to have to suffer. But Jesus is making it very clear and speaking very bluntly to Peter. And he said, you get behind me, Satan. He called Peter Satan. You might not think that's what that's talking about. If you want to try to explain it to me some other way. But I think he called Peter Satan right here. He said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. And I don't think Peter ever forgot. <laughs> I don't think he ever, from that time on, I don't think he ever forgot. The fact that Jesus was going to have to suffer. Yeah. If Jesus ever again. See the Bible doesn't record everything that Jesus ever said. But if, he, if Jesus ever again was around Peter. And said I've got to go suffer now. I bet Peter didn't open his mouth and said. Lord I'll be, I'll be praying for you. I know you're going to have to suffer. I understand now you're going to have to suffer. And 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 we all are going to have to suffer as Christians. Not just talking about suffering the various kinds of infirmities and inflictions that our bodies have in sickness and growing old and things like that. But I'm talking about that we have to learn to suffer as a Christian. We have to be willing to have people say all manner of evil against 
us falsely for Christ's sake. We have to be willing to be persecuted for Christ's sake. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He also wrote to Timothy and said, If we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. And that reigning with him is here in this world. God's people can reign with Christ in the kingdom of heaven. It's only though when we are willing to suffer with him that we will reign with him. Now, look in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 11. I want us to begin by looking at the fact that you and I as the people of God, we need to be willing to suffer. We need to even choose to suffer rather than choosing an easy life. My flesh and your flesh will always choose the path of least resistance. My flesh and your flesh does not want to suffer. If I have a choice of an easy road to walk and a hard road to walk, I'm going to choose usually, I'm going to choose the easy route. But as a Christian, we can't do that. And so look in your Bibles at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Let's see that the Word of God tells us here about Moses. And the Scripture tells us that he chose to suffer. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 11. Listen please, beginning in verse 24. The Word of God says in Hebrews eleven twenty-four, 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather... To suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He had a choice to make. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Brethren, every born again child of God needs to know that if you choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin and your flesh does enjoy the pleasures of sin but if that's the choice you make you need to understand two things you need to understand what Paul uh, declares here is that you can only as a child of God you can only enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because in the life of every child of God Though you may enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, you need to understand those pleasures of sin are going to stop. And you need to understand also not only can you only enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but you need to know that God will bring his judgments in your life if you choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So you need to understand they're going to end those pleasures of sin. They're going to stop. And God's judgment is coming in our lives if we choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin rather than choosing to suffer affliction. To what? To suffer affliction with the people of God. I'm glad to be able to be a part of a church that's willing to suffer for Christ's sake. I am thankful that that as a church body that you're willing to do what God's word says rather than to enjoy the prestige of men or the glory of men rather to enjoy rather than enjoying the esteem of men you would rather enjoy the fellowship of Christ and that's the choice we make when we choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin when we choose to please men rather than pleasing God, we're losing fellowship with God. Choose to suffer. That's what Moses did. The Bible says that that's what Peter did. That's what Paul did. That's what all the other saints of God, Old and New Testament, every one of them that ever walked with God, they made a right choice. And the choice was to follow God. But when they chose to follow God, they were choosing to suffer afflictions. And I need to be willing to suffer as a Christian. Go with me forward in your Bibles just a couple of pages after it talks about Moses chose to, afflict, to suffer afflictions. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5. 
Listen please to verses 10 and 11. James chapter 5 verses 10 and 11. The word of God says, James is writing, Now remember, who is the one person that wrote more about suffering in the Bible than anyone else? Who is that one man? Peter. Peter. You just got a whole basket full of scriptures where Peter's talking about suffering. And he learned something on that day when he didn't want Jesus to suffer. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He learned Christians have to suffer. And so now he helps us. By writing so much about suffering that we're without excuse. You cannot read what Peter wrote and not understand you're going to have to suffer. Peter has saved a lot of children of God from having Jesus rebuke them like he rebuked Peter. He has saved them sharp rebuke from Jesus by giving us those words. If the people of God will listen to the word of God and they'll listen to what Peter wrote, it will save us. From having to go through what Peter did in his life. And then Paul writes a lot about suffering. And now James. Listen James chapter 5. James 5 verses 10 and 11. The word of God says. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. For an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Now we talked earlier about suffering. And the importance of us patiently enduring suffering. And now he says, now, James is writing and James says, I want you to take as an example the prophets, as an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. As you go back and study the Old Testament, you study those great prophets, study about Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all those great prophets, and you'll find in every one of their lives they suffered and, and the Bible in the New Testament says, now, you take those as an example of suffering. And then in verse 11, he says this, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Happy which endure what? Happy which endure suffering. Those who patiently endure suffering, joy comes. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God blesses his people when they're willing to suffer for Christ's sake. And so he says now in verse 11, he says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Patience in what? I ask you, patience in what? Patience in suffering. He says, you've heard of the patience of Job. Patience in suffering. And have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now, the New Testament says... Remember those prophets. Take them as a good example of people who suffered. Then he says, and also remember Job. Yeah. Remember how Job suffered. Back up in your Bibles to Job just a moment. Since the New Testament tells us to remember Job. And brethren, Job is, he is one, of, you need to know the book of Job. You need to study the book of Job. There are, I think there are 42 chapters in the book of Job. And I want to encourage everybody here, read the book of Job over and over and over. There's a lot for me and you to learn from the book of Job. Not just in the first two or three chapters, but all the way through the book of Job. Every page, there's a lot for us to learn about suffering in the book of Job. About how to take suffering patiently. In Job, listen in Job chapter 1, you remember how the devil came to Jesus and they, uh, the Lord said to Satan, this is, uh, this is Job chapter 1 and verse 8. The Lord said to Satan, hast thou considered, listen to these words, my servant Job. <laughs> There's several of you that I would say, you're my son, you're my son, you're my son. Now, when God says to Satan, have you considered my servant, Job? Isn't that a blessing? God called him his servant. Job didn't call himself a servant of God. Other people didn't just call him a servant of God. God said, look at my servant. Look at him. I want you to watch the wording he says. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? I want you to think about that. What if tonight... If God says to Satan, Satan, look all over the earth. There's nobody on the earth like Brother Philip. You understand? 
At this point in time, there was nobody on the earth that was as close to God as Job was. And what, what is God doing when he says, Satan, <laughs> look at Job. You know what he's doing? You know what God knows he's fixing to do? God knows he's fixing to allow Satan to wreak havoc in his life. Was God wrong to do that? No, no listen brethren. Every child of God, every saint of God that has ever suffered much, that knows anything about the Bible, they have remembered Job. Yeah. They thought a lot about Job. I've many times in my life I've thought about, you know, I have never suffered as much in one day as Job did. No. Neither have you. No. In one day. Satan began to come into Job's life and began to afflict him and the first thing he did was took away every possession he had and he was a rich man and he took away all of his possessions and then he came and he took away Job was blessed with ten children and in one day Job lost, lost not only all of his possessions but all ten of his children died in one day and his servants were dying. Boom, boom, boom. His servants, his sheep, his cattle, his oxen. And then all ten of his children were dead. And Job, the scripture says in Job 1 verse 20, look at the wording. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think Job was weeping? Do you think Job was crying? Do you think Job was suffering? Yes, yes he was suffering. This idea that some saints of God don't suffer is just a lie from the devil. Job suffered. He wept. He cried. Job 1 verse 20, the word of God says, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return to the, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I just want us to all just jump up and start saying, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I'll tell you, brethren, for a man to stand like Job stood, it's a reason for all the other saints of God to stand up and salute him and say, Good job, Job. Amen. Good job. Yeah. Excellent job. Yeah. I love to see the saints of God, when they're enduring temptation, I love to see them take it patiently. Yeah. I love to see saints of God that are going through trouble and heartache and physical problems and persecutions and they never question God. They do as Job does here and they say the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And they never doubt God and they never question God and they never get angry with God. They're happy in the Lord. They're suffering the way the Bible tells us to suffer. And the devil wasn't satisfied. And so then the devil and God talk again. And see, God has already told Satan he couldn't touch his body. And now in chapter 2, God and the devil are talking. And the Lord says, now you can touch his body. But you can't take his life. And Satan began to afflict Job with boils. From the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. His body was covered in boils. And those boils were painful. If you've ever had one boil, how many of you have ever had a boil? I'll tell you, brethren, they are painful. One boil is painful. And Job had them all over his body. You can't comprehend the pain his body was in. You can't comprehend how ugly Job looked with those boils all over his body. And he was reeking and ravished with pain. He was suffering beyond description. And his wife finally said, Curse God and die. Mm. Yeah. Tracy, don't you ever do that. <laughs> I just give up. I don't think I'm as strong as Job. In all my sufferings, my wife has always been faithful to stand by me. Job's wife said, curse God and die. And listen... I want to read 9 and 10. Job chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Do you, think, do you think Job suffered when his wife said that? You think Job suffered? You think it hurt him to hear her say that? Job chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, that is to Job, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? 
Curse God and die. But he, that's Job, said unto his wife, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not. In all this, did not Job sin with his lips. He suffered. And he did it patiently. And he endured. Now, I know that in chapter 3, if you go read chapter 3, you know what he does? He begins to cry and wail and say, oh, I wish I'd never been born. It's all right. It's all right, brethren. You think God was mad with him? I don't think the Lord was mad with him. Job got weary. Job wore out. The Lord remembers we're flesh. The Lord was still pleased with Job's life. I'll tell you why I know the Lord was pleased with Job's life in spite of the fact that he got weak and weary and faint. began to argue with his friends and his friends argued with him about what sin had caused such horrible pain in his life. Go to the end of the book of Job, Job chapter 42. This is a wonderful thing about suffering. Did you know that God, I'm going to say this, I believe that God always reverses and takes away. Eventually, God always reverses the suffering. Now please listen to what I mean. Job suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered. And then in the end of the book of Job, in Job chapter 42, Job 42 and verse 5, Job says to God, he says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Brethren, Job was closer to God at the end of all that he went through. He was closer to God than he had ever been before. He said in Job 23, he said, I know God's working in front of me and behind me and on the left hand and right hand, but I can't find him anywhere. I can't find the Lord. I don't feel his presence. I don't feel his peace. But I know that he knows where I am and what I'm going through. And when he's through with me, I'll come forth as gold tried in the fire. This is a fulfillment of that. (laughs) He came through on the other side. He came forth as gold tried in the fire. He saw the Lord clearly now. You think Peter saw the Lord clearly when he had rebuked Jesus and Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You think Peter began to see Jesus more clearly there? I think he did. Right here, Job sees the Lord clearly. And then Job prayed for his friends. Look at verse 10. Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends you think it was hard for him to pray for his friends? Do you think his flesh wanted to... Listen, brethren, I would have said, Lord, now, I've been through a lot, and I think you need to put all three of those friends through the same thing I went through so they can experience what I've experienced. And then I want you to send some friends to them and have their friends tell them, you've done something wrong. What kind of sin have you committed to cause all this suffering? Had Job done wrong to cause the suffering that he was going through? Absolutely not. Job was a righteous man, a man that feared God, a man that shunned evil. It was not Job suffering for evil doing. It was Job suffering as a trial of his faith. And his faith was strong. And in the end, what did God do? God gave him, God gave him twice of what he had before. Some people say, well, he just got ten more children. I'll tell you what, you ask anybody that's ever had a child to die, they never lose that child. Now, Job's ten children died, and God gave Job ten more children. And Job had twenty children when it was all over. You understand me? And all those animals, he gave him twice as many of each of those animals. When he got to the children, he gave him ten more children. And now he's got twenty children instead of ten He has 10 that are with him, and he has 10 that are home with the Lord, but he's still got his 20 children. Be willing to suffer. Be willing to suffer. Be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. Be willing to endure suffering. Be willing to take it patiently. 
The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 18, he says, I reckon that the sufferings, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. <laughs> I think Job could have said the same thing. He, he could have said when it was all over, he said, you know, I reckon that the sufferings I went through back there, they were nothing compared to the glory that I'm experiencing in Job 42. He experienced the glory of the Lord. He saw the Lord clearly. He had heard, heard about God. He knew the Lord, but he didn't know God as well as he did when he went through, finished going through all of those sufferings. Listen carefully in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29. Listen carefully in closing. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul by inspiration of God. He says in Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. For unto you. How many of you believe in Jesus? How many of you believe in Jesus? Believe in Jesus. I'm glad you believe in Jesus. And I think probably... Most children of God, I think most of them believe in Jesus. And it's good to believe in Jesus. But there's something more that Jesus has told you to do. There's something more that God has told you to do other than just believe in Jesus. Right. Philippians 1, 29, the word of God says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. He's called on you to believe on him. But he's also called on you to suffer for his sake. May God help us, brethren. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, after he said it's been given to you, not only to believe on Christ, but also to suffer. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Suffering, suffering, suffering for well-doing. Suffering as a child of your faith. Suffer for Christ's sake. Be willing to endure suffering because there's joy at the end of suffering. Is my Oh, here's the closing. <laughs> Don't know right where it is right now, but listen. Jesus said, I think it was maybe when he was walking with the two men from Emmaus. On, and he said this, he said, when they were very sad because Jesus had suffered and died, Jesus said to those men, Ought not Christ to have suffered and to enter into his glory? You see that? Ought not Christ to have suffered and to what? Enter into his glory. One day, by the grace of God, we're all going to enter into his eternal glory. But we can enter into his glory right now in the kingdom of heaven, if we're willing to suffer for Christ's sake. May God help us, is my prayer.